Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So it's my pleasure to uh, welcome and introduce uh, Fredo Durand, who's a professor at MIT. And he almost needs no introduction. He is one of the superstars in graphics with an amazing number of papers at SIGGRAPH and SIGGRAPH Asia in recent years. Um, he's one of the founders of uh, the Computational Photography Symposium and Conference. Uh, he has really strong influence in those areas. And today he's going to give us an overview, I think, of several different areas of his work at MIT. So welcome, Frito. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be back. And Yux uh, is one of the few people who can pronounce my name correctly. So always good to be here. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to uh, show you a, a few overviews of recent work we've done, and then I'll spend more time on an area that we're pretty excited about, which is to use computation to reveal things that are hard to see uh, with the naked eye. Uh, but before this, let me show you a couple of things we, we've done in uh, good old image synthesis, in compiler uh, for image processing, and something about online education and video lecture authoring. Uh, for a few words about uh, global illumination, uh, it's still not a completely solved problem. Uh, simulating the interplay of light within scenes uh, is still computationally extremely challenging, and uh, anything we can do to make it more efficient is, is really needed. And uh, with a number of co-authors from Finland, uh, Jako Lettinen being the, the lead one, uh, we came up with this new technique that makes a better use of the samples that what that we use to sample light transport. And we build on this technique called Metropolis Light Transport that seeks to place um, sample light rays proportional to the light contribution. And it's an old idea by Eric Veach from a while back. Uh, it's pretty good at it. The only problem is that um, a lot of areas of light space um, contribute a lot to the image, but they're kind of boring. There isn't much going on, and so you shouldn't need that many samples to, um, to compute them efficiently. Uh, in particular, you know, in a scene like this, this whole area is very uniform, and you shouldn't need that many samples to uh, compute it. So instead, what uh, Yako and, and the guys came up with is this idea of sampling according not to uh, the image contribution, but according to the contribution to the gradient of the image. And you see here, this is our sample density. We really focus in these areas uh, where things matter. So here I visualize it in the space of, of the image, but under the hood, everything happens in the space of light path. So you know, a light path could be something that goes from the light, bounces off the screen, on the ground, and then on you. So it's, it's in this complex abstract space that we have to sample according to the gradient of the image. Um, and so whereas, uh, and so th this path space for a very simplified version could be shown as this, you know, maybe this is my receiving surface, this is where I want to compute light, and this is my light source. So for each point here, I want to take into account the contribution from all the points here. So abstractly, I can show it as a 2D space where this is my light, these are my pixels or my surface coordinates. And in regular metropolis, um, you know, because there's this occluder, uh, this whole area of light space doesn't contribute to the image, and this one contributes a lot. So with regular metropolis, your samples after your Markov chain process would be distributed roughly like this, and then you just count the number of samples for each column, and, and you're done. You get your approximation of the image. So instead, what we're doing is um, we're sampling this space according to the finite difference contribution to the gradient of the image. So instead of having one sample, we get like pairs of samples where we look at the difference. And we place this proportional to uh, the gradient, so we get a lot of these in this area of the simplified light space and not so many of these in this area. And the cool thing is that uh, not only do we have a placement of the samples that's more according to where things actually happen, but in addition, in areas like these, um, all these samples do tell us that there isn't anything happening, that the gradient should be zero in all these areas. So not only do you get a better representation of places where things change, but you also get more information that, you know, even though your sampling distribution is low, the information that you have is pretty strong, and you know that you should reconstruct something pretty smooth. 
Uh, so the basic idea is pretty simple. Uh, it gets fa fairly messy as you do it in the general uh, path space with you know path of arbitrary lengths and etc. And if you don't pay attention to the math, this would be an example of some of the math, the main math you need to pay attention to. Um, instead of approximating ground truth images like this, um, you're going to get a result like that uh, because somewhere there's a Jacobian that creeps in, and you're not. Uh, if you don't pay attention, you won't be computing the integral you think you're computing. And I'll refer you to the paper if you like uh, math integrals and changes of coordinate. And if you do the right thing and take this term into account, you actually get the true approximation. Um, uh, and so this will be presented at SIGGRAPH by, uh, by Yako this summer. Now, no transition, because uh, the next topic is completely different. Uh, something I've become very excited about is uh, the potentials of online education and digital education in general. Uh, and I'm very interested in this style of video lecture that you probably saw uh, popularized by the Khan Academy, where um, you see a virtual whiteboard lecture, where uh, you see the writing going on as the person is narrating what they're doing. A lot of people find these compelling. I won't get into the debate of whether that's the best format. Uh, but certainly, there are a lot of people who wish they could uh, generate content like this and who don't have the talent of Salkan to get it right in, in one go. Because the, the sad truth is that uh, the authoring software to do things like this, or I mean, it's not that they're bad. It's that they're non-existent. I mean, people just take some screen capture software and whatever drawing program they like. I know a lot of people like uh, Microsoft Journal or Microsoft PowerPoint. Uh, but the bad news with these things is that you have no editing capability. If you get anything wrong, you essentially have to restart your uh, lecture from scratch. And so I claim that this is very similar to uh, typing text on a typewriter. So sure, I mean, with a typewriter, you can correct your mistakes. You can restart the page from scratch. Or maybe you can scratch thing and then write the correct word later. But it's really like the stone age of authoring capabilities. And we've all grown accustomed to being able to edit text in a very non-sequential manner. I mean, the order in which you're going to type the letters really doesn't have to be the final order of the text. You want to you know, insert sentences, delete some, correct some word, maybe even reorganize, you know, put this paragraph in front of that other paragraph. And so all these modern tools really make the creative process, the authoring process, very non-sequential. And so. Um, because I was so appalled by the state of the art of tools out there, I decided that I could do better. Uh, and so I decided to implement my own software. And this is a short video that will show you what it can do. Authoring handwritten lectures with current approaches is challenging because you must get everything right in one go. It is hard to correct mistakes. Content cannot be added in the middle. You must carefully plan how much space you need. And audio synchronization is hard because writing tends to be slower. We present Pentimento, which enables the non-sequential authoring of handwritten video lectures. Pentimento relies on a new sparse and structured representation that builds on space-time strokes and adds discrete temporal events for dynamic effects, such as color changes or basic animation. We also decouple audio and visual time and use a simple retiming structure based on discrete correspondences interpolated linearly. This makes it easy to maintain and edit synchronization. Let's look at an authoring session with Pentimento. We can record strokes over time with the standard pen interface. The lecture area is the white rectangle in the center. If we run out of space, we can keep writing in the red safety margin, stop recording, and edit the layout using a familiar vector graphics interface. However, our edits are retroactive and affect the stroke from its inception. The lecture's temporal flow is preserved, and the equation looks as if it was written with the correct size in the first place. We continue our derivation, but we decide that we went too fast and that an extra step might help students. We move this equation down to make room for the new step, using another retroactive edit. We move the time slider back to where we want to insert the new content. We press record and add the new line. We perform more layout refinement and complete our demonstration. In this scenario, we have focused on visuals first, and we now move on to recording the audio. We first make the audio and visual timelines visible. We proceed piece by piece and select in the visuals the part that we want to narrate. We press the audio recording button and say our text. The audio gets automatically synchronized with the selected visuals. 
we proceed to other visuals and record the corresponding audio. We can also select in the audio timeline and record. Our approach relies on discrete synchronization constraints between the audio and visual time, which are visualized as red ellipses in the audio timeline. We can add constraints by selecting the visuals, moving the time slider to the audio time where the appropriate narration occurs, and using the timing menu or a keyboard shortcut. Here we set the end of these visuals to occur when this audio is heard. We can also drag constraints to change their audio time or their visual time, and the visual timeline and the main view reflect the change. We can also delete silence, and the visuals get sped up automatically. Once we have recorded the audio, we realize that the derivation could be clearer if we replace the mean mu by e of x. We first make space for the change. We select the strokes we want to replace and press the redraw button. We write e of x, and the timing of the new content automatically conforms to the old one and preserves audio synchronization. We also realize that some of the narration doesn't have corresponding illustrations. We make space and use draw to add visuals without affecting the audio. We derive a fundamental identity for variance. Variance is usually written sigma square. It is defined as the expectation of the square difference between x and its expectation. We can distribute the square, which gives us the expectation of x square minus 2x e of x plus e of x square. We use linearity and take constants such as 2 and e of x outside of the expectation. We get e of x square minus 2 e of x e of x plus e of x square. We clean up this e of x e of x and get e of x square minus 2 e of x square plus e of x square. We now cancel one of the two negative e of x square with a positive e of x square, and we get the final equation. Variance is equal to e of x square minus e of x square. Ray tracing is a fundamental computer graphics algorithm. It allows us to go from a 3D scene to an image. The scene is represented digitally. For example, a sphere is encoded by the xyz coordinates of its center and its radius. And this is the topic that General got me started on this. I tried to make one with standard tools. And I started my drawing too big. I didn't we have enough have space. It was a disaster, and I just stopped and, and didn't retry until the I had my tool. The image is specified by a viewpoint, a viewing direction, and a field of view. Our goal is to compute the color of each pixel. The algorithm is as follows. For each pixel in the image, we create a ray from the viewpoint to the pixel. Then for each geometric primitive in the scene, we compute the intersection between the ray and the primitive, and we only keep the intersection that is closest to the eye. Once we have found which primitive is visible at the pixel, we need to compute its color, which is called shading. We take into account the position of light sources and cast additional rays so this from visible case, the audio points to the light to first, test whether the point And then I did the visual based on the audio. Uh, was also you can do it in whatever in order you video want. Lectures on a variety of topics that include probabilities, barcodes, Magellan's voyage, diffraction, computational geometry, and many others. The executable is included in the submission, as well as a quick manual. Thank you. And so I'm, I'm hoping, well, I'm hoping to spend a lot of my summer debugging this thing and getting the UI usable, and hopefully uh, by early fall, uh, it'll be released free, open source, blah, blah, blah. So. Do you use it already? Um, I use it for my class. I've been using it in, in lecture. There are a number of uh, extra bits and pieces that I modify to make it usable in lecture. Uh, I've been enjoying it. I don't think the students have been enjoying it as much because <laughs> teaching new content with a new tool where you spend your brain power thinking, oh, is it going to crash? Did I screw up this part of the code? It's maybe not the best idea, but, uh, but it's been kind of fun to, uh, to use a Wacom tablet in lecture rather than the, the Blackboard or a small tablet PC screen. Yeah. Uh, Another completely different topic, maybe I'll try to go even faster on this one because I think that Jonathan is going to come to MSR to give a talk soon and, and 
he understands all this a lot better, but uh, just as a, uh, some advertisement for his talk. So this is a compiler uh, that we created to get really high performance image processing. Uh, the two people who really made it happen are Jonathan Reagan Kelly, who's a grad student finishing with me, uh, and Andrew Adams, who, um, who was a postdoc with me and is now at Google. And the goal really is to, to get high performance in image processing and we all know that these days you can't get good performance without parallelism and that parallelism is hard to achieve and both the um, multi-core and the SIMD aspect are really tough. But equally important is to achieve locality, meaning that you want your data to stay in the various cache levels as much as possible. And this is equally, if not more, difficult to achieve. And the combination of these two uh, makes writing high performance code really hard. And usually, you have to play with a trade off between uh, various aspects. You know, locality and parallelism are the two big goals that, that you want to achieve. And very often, the price you have to pay is that you're going to need to do redundant work. And in image processing, that's typically uh, that you organize your computation according to tiles. So rather than computing the whole image for each each stage of your computation, you know, uh, stage one whole image, stage two whole image, you're going to merge the stages and compute it tile by tile. And the price you have to pay, so this, this maximizes uh, locality and parallelism, but you usually have to do redundant work uh, at the boundary of the tiles. Um. And um, usually, we tend to think of uh, performance coming from um, a, a good interplay between powerful hardware and good algorithm, and that these are the two knobs that we have to make our computation as fast as possible. And for most of us, we're just software people, so all we can do is write a good piece of software. But we think that it's useful to split this notion of a program into two sub-notions. One of them is the algorithm itself. And given an algorithm, given a set of arithmetic computations that you want to achieve, essentially, there's a big question of the organization of this computation in space and time. Uh, and the, the, best, uh, the best choice will give you the best trade-offs. So what do I mean by the separation of algorithm and organization of the computation? Well, we can start from something very simple, which the compiler people have known and exploiting for a long time. Just look at this very simple two-stage blur. Uh, so this is a three-by-three three box filter. The first stage is a blur in X, uh, double loop on the pixels. Blur in X is just the average of three neighbors. Actually, it's the sum here, but it's the same. And then we do a blur in Y. So you know, this is uh, one piece of program that does this computation. But I can swap the order of these two loops, the 4X, 4Y. It's still the same algorithm. The computation is just organized differently. Uh, but in this particular case, uh, I think you get a 15X speed up. Oops messing up my, um, my slides. So just because you get much better locality by doing the loops in the same order of things are stored. So this is pretty well known that uh, the order of the loop can be changed, and most decent compilers will do it. But um, if we want to get high performance image processing, we want to take this notion of separating the algorithm from the organization a little bit further. Because if you look at an actually high performance version of this 3 by 3 blur, it might look like something like this. Uh, so believe it or not, but the same algorithm that we had before is still hidden here. I don't expect you to understand what's going on here. You've got some SIMD stuff. Um, or pairs of loops have turned into four loops uh, because things are tiled, again, to maximize this locality. Um, and the main message is that A, this code is really ugly and hard to maintain, and that the changes are pretty deep and global. It's not just that you're going to optimize your inner loop and write it in assembly uh, and all that. It's also that you really org reorganized uh, your computation and that your whole code is affected, which in particular means that it's very difficult to have a library approach to this problem because the library can optimize every single stage of your pipeline, and then you put them together. But for actually really fast code, you want optimization that goes across stages of your pipeline. And libraries don't naturally do this. Um, 
And this code, by the way, gives you another order of magnitude speed up. So by swapping the order of the loop, we got a factor of 15. And here we get another factor of 11. Uh, so you know, if you're MATLAB programmers who think that all you have to do to get fast image processing is to code it in C++, well, it depends. If you code this C++, yeah, you'll get really fast uh, image processing. But uh, it's two orders of magnitude faster than a naive, well, a very, very naive C++. Uh, the ordering of the loop, uh, everybody should get this right. And so um, this whole reorganization of computation is actually hard, uh, both because the low-level mechanics of it are difficult. I mean, again, this is pretty ugly code. Uh, you need to change things at many levels of, of your pipeline. Um, but it's also hard just at a high level because you don't know what the good strategy might be. And if you're a company like Adobe, where they do really, and I'm sure Microsoft has people like this too, you know, you have people who will spend months uh, optimizing one pipeline, trying to parallelize it this way, trying tiles uh, here, maybe global computation there. Uh, but you know, it takes them a month to come up with one strategy, to, to implement one strategy. And so maybe you're going to try a different strategy if that one doesn't seem to be the best one. Maybe if you have a lot of time, you're going to implement a third strategy. Uh, but by then, you just have to ship the product and you're going to stop. Uh, and so this is pretty, ha pretty tough to come up with the best, um, the best option. Um, so this. And so. Halide's answer, our compiler, our language's answer, is to separate the notion of algorithm, uh, which in practice we encode in a simple functional formulation. So here you've got the blur x and blur y. Uh, just put it in terms of uh, the output of his blur x uh, function is this as a function of its input. And similarly, blur y has this expression and uses blur x as input. So very simple. And this algorithm will not change as you try to optimize uh, its organization. And for this, we have a cool language where you have simple instructions that allow you to specify things like tiling, parallelism, SIMD, and things like this. Um, and, I, I'll, and, and what the schedule does uh, is two things. For each pair of input and output functions, so for example, blur x and, and blur y, it uh, specifies the order in which you're going to traverse the pixels for this function. It also specifies when its input should be computed. So blur y needs blur x to be computed. So when are we going to compute blur x? Are we going to compute it all at once for the whole image? Are we only going to compute it for a small subset of pixels around the pixel that we need? And these are the two big high-level decisions that you have to make uh, for each input-output pair. Um, and uh, Jonathan will tell you a lot more about this. But the cool thing is that uh, it's not just a random set of small you know, tricks to optimize your thing. Um, you really get a, a nice parameterization of the space of trade-offs and the space of, of schedules uh, along various axes, um, which you can specify as you know, the granularity at which you compute things on the one hand keep all this, and the granularity at which you store things. And we showed that uh, all these points in the space correspond to different trade-offs and might be valuable for various algorithms. And lots of animation. Um, and just to you know, give you a teaser, so first of all, this is the C++ code I showed you before. This is the corresponding Halide program. These two pieces of code have exactly the same performance. And by the way, Halide is embedded in C++, uh, so it's reasonably easy to incorporate it into your, your C++ program. Uh, we use um, embedded, uh, it's, it's an embedded language. And to give you a sense of the kind of performance that we, that we can get, uh, Jonathan spent his summer at Adobe uh, last year. And he took one of the stages in the uh, camera row um, pipeline, the one that does shadow highlight uh, clarity. Uh, it's a local Laplacian filter algorithm that was developed by Sylvain Perez. Um, and uh, the Adobe version was uh, implemented by one of their really uh, strong programmers. I mean, to give you a sense, this guy is in a team that has only two people. It's him and Thomas Knoll, the inventor of Photoshop. So it, uh, he's really good. 
uh, and he spent three months to optimize uh, this code. Uh, his code was 10 times faster than the, the research code that he started with, uh, but that took him 1,500 lines of code uh, just for this stage of the pipeline. Um, so Jonathan uh, spent the summer there, re-implemented this uh, algorithm and optimized it with Halide, and within uh, one day he had code that was 60 lines instead of 1,500 lines, and that ran actually two times faster than the Adobe code that, that we started from. Um, and the thing that's even cooler is that uh, our language targets not only x86, but also GPUs and ARM cores. So, you know, in no time, just maybe you want to change the schedule a little bit because the trade-offs are not the same. Uh, you can get the GPU version. Yes? Are you constrained by the layout of input data, or is that a flexible thing that this gets to optimize? Um, in our experience, the layout of the input data is not that critical. Uh, we um, because in practice, three by three box filter. Pardon? <laughs> For a three by three box filter. Yeah, we've been disappointed. I mean, I, I had a master's student that I told you know go work on the layout and you know let's also allow people to optimize their layout. And so far, he's come back and saying I get no performance gain. Uh, we can talk about this, and you should talk about it with Jonathan. Kind of the intuition is that you have enough intermediate stages and um, the prefetchers and the cache systems, especially on the next 86, are so good that um, as long as you do the granularity of the computation itself right, the layout in the cache is going to end up being right and things are going to work out okay. Uh, it was kind of surprising, yeah, it was, yeah. Now I had to find another master subject for this guy, so it was a little bit of a surprise, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, so uh, go see Jonathan's talk whenever he visits. Uh, the language is open source at halidelang.org or something like this. Uh, the documentation is still, you know, it's, it's a research project. Uh, we're hoping to create a bunch of tutorials this summer so that it's a little easier to, to pick up. Um, and there, there's uh, a lot of enthusiasm about it at uh, Adobe and especially at Google, where uh, in particular Zalman Stern, who's the guy who created Lightroom at Adobe and now moved to Google, is very excited about it and has been contributing a variety of things, including a JavaScript backend, which... I don't completely understand, but uh, he wanted to have fun. But he's also contributed a, a lot of exciting stuff. Um, and we're still working on the compiler, and we're, we're going to make it more and more useful, hopefully. All right. So now I come to the actual chunk of my talk that's going to be reasonably coherent. Um, and I want to tell you about uh, a whole research uh, area that uh, my colleague Bill Freeman and I are very excited about, uh, which is to use computation to reveal things that are hard to see with the naked eye. Um, I think that, uh, in general, this is a topic that uh, has been excited for centuries in science and engineering, and uh, scientists have developed lots of tools to go beyond the limits of human vision, you know, starting with telescopes, microscopes, and things like this, X-ray. Uh, and if you're interested in, in the area, uh, I have a keynote talk I gave last year where I put together a lot of these tools from outside computer science for most of them, and it was quite exciting to uh, to discover some of them that I didn't know about. So if you want to look at it, go, go see my slides. Uh, a lot of them are, are, are really fun, uh, especially like the stuff that um, takes phenomena that are not visual in nature and make them uh, visible. But the particular sub-area that I'm going to talk about today is looking at videos where apparently nothing is happening, but in fact you have a lot of changes in motion that are just below the threshold of human vision. So all these pictures are actually uh, videos, and you can't see anything moving, but that doesn't mean that there's no signal, there's nothing happening. Uh, certainly this person is alive, so he must be you know, breathing and his heart is beating. And you, know, you can't tell from this basic video, but we've developed techniques uh, that you can use to amplify what's going on here and reveal things like uh, these phenomena. So here we reveal the reddening of the face as blood flows through it. So with each heartbeat, there's a little more blood in the face and get a little bit redder. To give you a sense, it's... If you have an 8-bit image, it's maybe half a value, uh, but we can extract it and amplify it and show you things like this. Even when your eyes are still, they have uh, micro saccades and micro tremors, and we can amplify these. 
um, structures that look still are actually swaying in the wind, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so we started embarking on this journey a while back. In 2005, we um, published this work called Motion Magnification, where we took videos as input with some motion really hard to see, like this beam structure here uh, is bending a little bit when the per person is playing with the swing. And with our technique, we were able to take this very small motion and amplify it. Um, and the way we did this is uh, use standard computer vision techniques and image-based rendering ideas. Uh, we took the video, we used uh, motion analysis, we analyzed uh, feature points, and actually the, the algorithm that uh, Tso Liu, the main author of his work, developed to analyze motion is quite sophisticated and quite robust to things like occlusion. And given these trajectories, uh, we do a little bit of clustering to extract different modes of motion. So in practice, we want to amplify this red uh, segment. Uh, we do various things like uh, advecting the motion vector further, doing a little bit of texture synthesis to fill the holes. And at the end, we get these beautifully magnified videos. And um, we were quite excited about these results. Uh, but unfortunately, at the time, the work didn't have as much impact as we hoped for, partially because this technique was quite costly. Uh, we're talking about hours of computation to get these results. Uh, and the algorithm was sophisticated enough that uh, if you didn't have uh, Tso Liu next to you to make it run, it was really hard to use. Uh, to the point where we, uh, whenever we wanted to, com to compare to this algorithm for our new work, we've been unable to rerun the old code. So. Uh, <laughs> as sad as it might be. Um, and so um, this is partially why we developed uh, a new, much simpler technique, uh, which we call Eulerian video magnification. And that was presented at SIGGRAPH last summer. Uh, so this is work with uh, a number of people. The, the three main ones who made it happen are Hao Yu Wu, who was a master's student with me at the time, uh, Michael Rubinstein, uh, who's a superstar grad student whom uh, I believe Microsoft should hire, hopefully, uh, if, if you guys are smart. Uh, and uh, Eugene Shi, who was a former grad student working at Quanta Research. And then a number of faculty members who gave opinions. And well, no, we actually, uh, I should say, this is a project where I feel everyone on the list contributed at least one equation, uh, actually did some work. So. And in order to understand the difference between this new work and the old work we did on motion magnification, we need to borrow metaphors from uh, the fluid dynamics community, uh, where they, they make the very strong distinction between Lagrangian approaches and Eulerian approaches. And what they mean by this is that in the Lagrangian perspective, you take a little piece of matter, a little atom of water, and you follow it over time as it travels through the medium. In contrast, Eulerian uh, fans uh, just take one block of space at the same location and look at water coming in and out in this local position. So this one is a fixed frame. This one looks at moving frames. And of course, our previous work on motion magnification was essentially a Lagrangian approach where we would look at each of these um, pieces of the scene and see how they travel through the image. And then we just make them travel farther. And in contrast, the work I'm about to introduce just looks at more or less individual pixels, individual screen locations, look at the color changes at this location, and amplifies them. And the basic idea is really, really simple. Uh, you just look at the color value at each pixel. You consider it as a time series. So this is my time axis. This is my intensity axis, or my red, green, or blue axis. I mean, you know, very standard time domain signal processing. I can do whatever temporal filter I want. So typically, we extract a range of temporal frequencies. So if you're looking at uh, the heartbeat, it's going to be around 1 hertz, give or take. You amplify these time frequencies for this pixel and for all the other pixels ind independently. And then you just put them back in your video, and you're done. Um, in practice, it's a little more sophisticated by, than this. Not by a lot, actually. I mean, we just add a spatial pyramid on top of this, and that's kind of about it. I mean, it's the, really, the basic principle is just independent temporal processing on each pixel. Uh, 
a little bit of spatial pooling to reduce noise, a little bit of uh, pyramid processing to be able to control which spatial frequencies are amplified, but that's about it. And so uh, I'll, I'll first show you uh, how it can amplify color changes, which is unsurprising since that's kind of what we do. Uh, maybe the more, the more surprising aspect that we really did not expect is that it also amplifies spatial motion. Yes? Signature that you collect from the visual domain to get information about the signal is not always decoupled from some noise and some artifacts that may be due to some other processes. How would you go about filtering them and getting the real? <coughs> the, the, the child can move and you know the pixel difference could be because of that rather than his heartbeat. So. Um, well, ask me again at the end of the presentation if I did an answer, but the main, the main thing we do about noise, at least in the first version of the technique, is just spatial averaging, spatial low pass. I'm not saying that you couldn't do something smarter, but that, that's all we're doing, yeah. Um, all right. So yeah, as I said, uh, the basic color amplification technique is pretty simple. Uh, you take your um, your time series, uh, typically, especially for the heartbeat, uh, we do a pretty strong low pass on the image. I mean, I, I told you that the amplitude is less than the value, so you need to average a number of pixels before you get enough signal compared to your noise. But yeah, you just uh, choose your uh, frequency band in the time domain and just amplify. And uh, you get these cool results. Uh, actually, that, that's how the project started. We were working on a heart rate extraction, uh, something similar to what the new Kinect has what our colleagues at the Media Lab had developed, and we needed a debugging tool to understand what we were analyzing, so we decided to just visualize these color variation changes. Uh, it's actually kind of cool. It works on regular video cameras. You don't need uh, to do special acquisition setups. We're even able to play with footage from the Batman movie and verify that this guy has a pulse, which he does. Uh, you can extract the heart rate, so again, we're not the first ones to do this. We believe we do it better than other people, but um, we, we, we did some validation at a local hospital, and um, at least for our sleeping babies, um, our technique works as well as a regular monitor, uh, which actually I was surprised to discover that it's also the fact that regular monitors are not that good at extracting heart rate, which was surprising to me, but anyway. And so, as I said, we mostly developed this technique as a debugging tool for heart rate extraction. And when we looked at the first videos we processed, it was like, this is weird. This person is moving a lot compared to how much he was moving in the original video. What the hell is going on? And we really had no idea. It was really a, a, an accidental discovery. And so we went to uh, the Blackboard and tried to figure, that, to figure out what happens. And that's what I'm going to explain uh, in a minute. So you know, the fact that we can make things move in what seems to be kind of a Lagrangian aspect, that you know, these pixels are moving farther away, um, we need to study how local motion relates to intensity changes in order to understand why our simple technique actually does amplify spatial motion. And so let's look at what happens at a pixel when we have a translating object. So um, don't be confused, my horizontal axis is now space, so this is the x coordinate in my image, and the vertical axis is still intensity. So here I have a very simple case where you know, my intensity profile happens to be a sine wave uh, and it's moving to the right versus the next frame in blue. Right? And I've got my velocity dx over dt here. So now we're interested in how a single pixel changes under this translation. So this particular pixel happens to become brighter. Uh, this one is becoming darker. So uh, obviously the intensity variation uh, depends on the location. But we want to understand how it relates to spatial motion. And it's kind of obvious if you're looking at this diagram how this little horizontal edge relates to this vertical intensity difference, you've got a triangle here where the missing uh, edge of the triangle is actually the slope of my intensity. So it's essentially the image gradient. And so if I have uh, an object translating with this, um, with this horizontal velocity, the amount of vertical intensity change is going to be proportional to the slope of the intensity, the image gradient. Uh, so if you don't like uh, diagrams and you're more of an algebraic person, one way of looking at it is we're interested in the temporal intensity derivative di over dt. 
And you can argue that di over dt is di over dx times dx over dt. So that's the gradient, that's the velocity. And this is something that's really well known in the optical flow community. That's how you know, your Lucas Canade, your Hornshank algorithm uh, extract uh, velocity given intensity changes. So of course, in our case, uh, we don't know this. Uh, we could know this, but we don't care about it. All we do is we take this intensity change that's visualized vertically here and make it even bigger. So let's see what happens when we do this. We take this intensity change and we magnify it. And we do the same at each pixel. So in this case here, the intensity change is negative and we make it even more negative. And you see in this image that as we do this, it looks like we transported the sine, waves, the sine wave further to the right. Uh, and again, if you're an algebraic person, uh, we made di over dt bigger by a factor alpha, uh, which kind of, if you have the same di over dx, the same image gradient suggests that there was a dx over dt, a velocity that was bigger. And let me... Um, by the resolution. Oh yeah, it's uh, yeah. So in, in the paper we have derivations that that relate um, your spatial frequencies, the velocity, the amplification factor, and we also look how this compares to the Lagrangian approach. It's kind of interesting because the the sensitive the sensitivity to noise is not the same. So in some regime one is better, in some regime the other one is better. Um, let me show you a quick demo. Uh, so this is the same. Well, this is a Gaussian bump in this case. And you know, it's moving horizontally, right? Um, but now what we're studying is actually the vertical changes. So these are my, ver my intensity changes. And if I amplify them vertically, you see that it looks like my Gaussian move farther to the right. And it's not a perfect approximation. I mean, you see that we overshoot here. Uh, not surprisingly, this is the area where the second derivative of my function is pretty high because fundamentally this works only if my local derivative model, my di over dt, di over dx, is valid. And so this is when your first order Taylor expansion is, is, is a valid option. But since we're interested in very small motion that are impossible to see to the eye, this is precisely the regime in which uh, this matters. And this kind of explains, I mean, a number of people had proposed to do uh, temporal processing on pixel values, but uh, nobody had applied, it, uh, had applied it to very tiny motion. And this is where this uh, amplification of spatial translation actually works. I should say this is a, a visualization that was done by an undergrad, uh, Lily Sun. Uh, and these kind of visualizations are great summer projects for beginning undergrads. Um, so I lied a little bit. Our processing is not purely pixel-based. I mean, as I kind of said, we first do a spatial decomposition and we do the processing independently on each scale of the pyramid. And some scales might not be amplified because we know that uh, the, the, the approximation is not going to work. And so uh, we can amplify motion like this baby breathing, which is Michael Rubinstein's uh, baby. And you see that the spatial motion is really amplified. You also see a little bit of the overshooting where it gets too bright here. And this is the same thing as with the Gaussian bump. Uh, you might have seen this one. Maybe I'll skip it. Ah. Uh, I like this one because it shows that uh, you can do different temporal processing to extract different phenomena. So this is our input video. It's a high speed 600 frames per second guitar because we want to capture the uh, audio time frequencies. And if you amplify frequencies between 72 and 92 hertz, you see the motion of uh, the top string. And if you choose a different frequency band, 100 to 120, you see the second string because this one is an A versus uh, this one that was an E. So you have these degrees of freedom to choose which temporal component you're going to amplify. Well, I think this video is broken, but I'll, I'll show it better later. And as I said, we did a study that compares the Lagrangian versus the Eulerian approach uh, and showed at least with a simple model and for simple cases that you know, there's a regime where the Eulerian is better and one where the Lagrangian is better. Right? Yeah. 
it's actually kind of cool how some components of the noise get uh, canceled with the Eulerian because in the Lagrangian version, you're computing velocity from pixel variation, and then you're creating pixel variation from these motion vectors, and so uh, you end up accumulating error along the way. Uh, and thanks to our colleagues at Quanta Research, uh, uh, we have a web version that people can use. I don't, I don't think in this room it's as critical because uh, we also have MATLAB code and this is essentially a one hour project to reproduce. Uh, but it's been very useful for people who are not computer scientists who have been able to, to try out our technique for their application. So a number of people have posted YouTube videos uh, created with our code. Um, as someone who uh, has been using it for pregnant women, uh, belly visualization, it's, it gets a little freaky and very uh, alien-like. Um, yes, another one. Uh, you see they, they have to use some video stabilization because we amplify any motion we see, so you probably need to remove camera motion. Uh, somebody else has used it to visualize the spatial flow uh, of blood in the face by using a color grading after our process. And it's not real science if you don't have a guinea pig. And it turns out some people did apply the method in a guinea pig. And so uh, I don't remember how they said it. This is the first uh, Eulerian magnified uh, guinea pig in the world. Uh, and actually, one of my colleagues who does biology in Stanford is interested in using pretty much something like this uh, to look at the breathing of, of some of their um, lab mice uh, to see what's going on with their, their cancer research and to be able to tell earlier whether something is an effect or not. Um, so we've been pretty excited about uh, especially all the interest that uh, we've gotten from people in, in a lot of different areas. Um, but we are still a little uh, frustrated with the amount of noise that we end up for some of these videos because, of course, you amplify pixel variations. It's not just the signal that gets amplified. And so in order to uh, reduce noise, uh, we came up with a new technique that will be presented at SIGGRAPH this summer, uh, and that was developed by uh, Neil Wadwa and Michael Rubinstein, uh, and still in collaboration with Bill Freeman. And in order to understand the difference with the old, as in one-year-old version, you have to remember what I said, that essentially our, our Eulerian perspective, it works when you have a first-order Taylor expansion that's valid. And essentially, it assumes that locally, the image has a linear intensity with respect to space. So if your image is a linear ramp, things work perfectly. Unfortunately, um, uh, A, noise gets amplified as well as uh, whatever linear ramp you actually had. And B, especially because we need to use multi-scale processing with the pyramid, in practice, uh, the band of an image pyramid doesn't look like a bunch of linear ramps. It looks more like a bunch of local sine waves, because that's what bandpass does. So, uh, and, and the kind of artifact that you see is, is where this first order Taylor expansion breaks and things like here where you get really overshoot or undershoot. Uh, same thing we saw with the Gaussian. And so we created a new technique that instead of assuming that images are locally linear ramps, they're locally uh, sine waves, which is great if you want to do multi-scale processing. Um, and the good thing with sine waves is that uh, we know how to shift them. We have the wonderful shift phase theorem that tells us that uh, if your image undergoes translation, the only thing that happens to your Fourier representation, your sine wave representation, is uh, a change in the phase of your Fourier coefficient. So we know how to translate sine waves. So all we have to do is come up with local sine waves. So in practice, we do use um, steerable pyramids. Uh, which are essentially you know, local wavelets that look a little bit like this, very similar to Ga Gabor wavelet. Uh, but the, um, the isotope of uh, steerable pyramid that we use is actually complex valued. So most people use image pyramids that are real valued, uh, but we can get complex valued uh, pyramids that have both an odd and even component to them. So just like your Fourier transform uh, is not a bunch of signs, it's a bunch of complex exponentials. Um, complex valued steerable pyramid give you both a real and an imaginary part, which allows you to get a local notion of phase, uh, which you can then use for processing and for amplifying local motion. Um. And there are beautiful Fourier domain constructions and all this. We, uh, we give some of the details in the paper, and you can look at Eero Simon Shelley's webpage for, for more information. 
And so whereas the previous approach uh, used a Laplacian pyramid and just did a linear amplification of the time variation, uh, we use this steerable pyramid that has both, both a notion of scale and a notion of orientation, and that instead of being real valued is complex valued, and we turn these complex numbers into an amplitude and a phase, and the processing that we do is on the phase. So we take the local variations of phase and we amplify them, which really directly uh, turns into uh, increasing the local spatial translations. Uh, and it works a lot better than the old technique. Uh, so in red, it's the old technique, so I'll let me play it once. We have a Gaussian bump that's moving to the right. Blue is the ground truth. We are increasing the motion. Uh, green is our new approximation, and red is the old one. So let me start it again. The beginning works fine. The old one breaks pretty quickly. You see this very strong overshoot. The, old, the new one uh, does better longer until eventually things go a little crazy, especially when you get phase wraparounds. Uh, but you know, roughly speaking, uh, the, the new method tends to work you know, four times better, meaning you can use an amplification factor that's four times higher. And the second big improvement is that uh, it reacts much better to noise. So with the old technique, with noise, you just amplify the noise linearly, at least the temporal component that you selected. Uh, and so you get crazy noise like this, and you, you saw effects like this in some of the videos I've shown. Even in the baby one, there was a lot, of, a lot more noise. With the new technique, we only modify the local phase, so we don't amplify noise amplitude, we just shift noise around, and so the local amplitude of the noise stays the same, it just moves a lot more. So that the noise performance is way, way better. And you should hopefully see this in these results. This is the old version, and this is the new version, and you see that uh, noise performance is significantly improved. You don't get the overshoot around the area of motion. Uh, the kind of artifact that you might get is a little bit of ringing. Uh, these are other results. This is the old version, this is the new version. Uh, same thing here. You see that the noise performance is really dramatically improved. And by the way, we, we try to apply denoising to the old technique. In some cases, it, it helps a lot, uh, but in some cases, it, uh, it actually hurts way more than, than it helps. So the, the new version is, uh, is way more robust to noise. And we can amplify changes that are as tiny as the, the small refraction changes when you have hot air around a candle. So in this case, the small changes in index of refraction due to air temperature cause small shifts in the background, and we can uh, visualize this and amplify it and give you a sense of airflow. And we're currently uh, working on techniques that um, would be able to uh, e extract quantitative information from this and give you air velocity information. Uh, so in the SIGGRAPH paper, we've got a lot more information, including how to play with the space over completeness trade-off to get a bigger range of motion. We have some ground truth comparisons to physical phenomena that are 10 times bigger, and we show that the technique gives you something reasonable. Uh, and so we really encourage you to go see the talk at SIGGRAPH that uh, Neil and Michael will give. Uh, and if you want to try it, the, the web page I mentioned now has the new version. Um, and I'll, I'll show you the beginning of a video we created for the NSF um, that demonstrates this. Actually, I'll show you different pieces if I can get, yes. Let's keep the intro. Mostly I'll show it because the explanation uses and my blood pulsates through video authoring system. Or the system. subtle breathing motions of a baby. These changes are hidden in ordinary videos we capture with our cameras and smartphones. Given an input video, for each pixel we analyze the color variation over time and amplify this variation, which gives us a magnified version of the video. So this is a case actually where because my handwriting is terrible, I first did a version of this uh, uh, this mini lecture. Uh, actually, I used a lot of resizing and spatial layout, as you can imagine. And then I asked one of my students that has a much better handwriting to just, you know, select the stuff and rewrite it. And because I have this redrawing tool, all the, the audio synchronization was preserved. Um, let me show you one of the cool results, the ones I really like. Uh, so this is a high-speed video of an eye uh, that's static. Uh, but even when they're static, our eyes move a tiny little bit 
uh, and we're hoping that this might be useful to some doctors. When a person fixates at a point, the eye may move from subtle head motions or from involuntary eye movements known as microsaccades. Such motions are very hard to notice, even in this close-up shot of the eye, but become apparent when amplified 150 times. And one final very brief mention of something that will be presented at CVPR this summer. Uh, we have a new technique with Guha Balakrishnan and John Gutag uh, that analyzes beats from video, but instead of using color information, we use motion information. I'll show you why that In this even video, works. We demonstrate that it's possible to analyze cardiac pulse from regular videos by extracting the imperceptible motions of the head caused by blood flow. Recent work has enabled the extraction of pulse from videos based on color changes in the skin due to blood circulation. If you've seen someone blush, you know that pumping blood to the face can produce a color change. In contrast, our approach leverages a perhaps more surprising effect. The inflow of blood doesn't just change the skin's color, it also causes the head to move. This movement is too small to be visible with the naked eye, but we can use video amplification to reveal it. Believe it or not, we all move like bobbleheads at our heart rate, but at a much smaller amplitude than this. Now you might wonder what causes the head to move like this. At each cardiac cycle, the heart's left ventricle contracts and ejects blood at a high speed to the aorta. During the cycle, roughly 12 grams of blood flows to the head from the aorta by the carotid arteries on either side of the neck. It is this influx of blood that generates a force on the head. Due to Newton's third law, the force of the blood acting on the head equals the force of the head acting on the blood, causing a reactionary cyclical head movement. To demonstrate this process, we created a toy model using a transparent mannequin head where rubber tubes stand for simplified arteries. Instead of pumping blood, we will pump compressed air provided by this air tank, and I can release the air using this valve. Now watch what happens as I open and close the valve once a second, similar to a normal heart rate. Ready? Here. This motion is fairly similar to the amplified motion of real heads that we've seen before. We exploit this effect to develop a technique that can analyze pulse and regular videos of a person's head. Our method takes an input video of so a stationary person. This, uh, and most of the components are pretty standard, you know, it's Lucas Canadi tracking, a little bit of PCA, a little bit of extraction. And the cool thing is that at the end we can and gender, get, and we're able to get not just the heart, but we also get individual beat locations, In addition, which gives our method us produces similar beat, beat variations. So this is a histogram of beat length. An exciting result that shows that we can capture more subtle information about the heart technique. than just an and average I'm rate. told that this has Finally, diagnosis uh, application. Of the head. Don't ask me the too much, I'm not the right kind of doctor. From the back of a subject's and unlike head, the color of version, you can get heart rate from the back of someone's head or in Halloween situations. So really the, uh, the thing I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to emphasize is I think this whole area of revealing invisible things using computational tools uh, is very rich. And I think that in vision and graphics, we really have uh, the right intellectual tools to, to make a lot of things happen. And I, I encourage everyone to do research in this area. Thank you. Over time, you're welcome to leave, but we'll stick around for questions. Maybe five, five minutes or questions. Hi, uh, I'm Sid Kuller. I work here in the Pew Group. Uh, so my question for the buzz from head motion is: uh, How much uh, robust are you to regular head motion? Or, um, Depends how regular regular is. Uh, um, random head motion. Let's say I'm working in front of my laptop and. Yeah, so I mean, th th this is the thing we're trying to test, you know, how far we can go in people's activity. So if you're like running on a treadmill, it's not going to work. Um, typing on the keyboard seems to be fine. And then we're trying to find where the exact limit is. Uh, certainly, actually, the biggest motion that we have to fight against is breathing uh, for, for people being static. And the second part of my question is, how much prior information do you need to get that peak signal out? Like do you actually specify a band like you did in the Eulerian uh, or the Eulerian The band is pretty broad. Um, I think these days we just specify if it's a, if it's a, a, a newborn because their, their heart rate is so much higher. I don't remember what band he's using, but I think it's like 0.5 hertz to 2 or 3 hertz, something like this, so it's reasonably broad. Yes. 
So did you accelerate your video amplification algorithms using your uh, language? Uh, <laughs> Yeah, no, uh, I've hired a student to do this this summer. Yeah, <laughs> the, we, we, want a, we want a real time version on the mobile device. And so, yeah, but, uh, we want them to do this. The, um, the phase based version is a little more tricky. Uh, there are ch um, partially, there are degrees of freedom in which steerable pyramid you use exactly. And there's probably, it's actually a more general issue for the compiler where so far we've assumed that the algorithm is fixed. But we all know that when you try to optimize your processing, you might decide, oh, you know, I'll use a cheaper version of the blur uh, in order to get the performance that I want. And, and this is exactly the kind of stuff that's going to happen, I think, with the pyramids. Yeah. So for, for your latest head motion work, um, have you done quantitative comparisons against the previous work? In other words, is it better or comparable? Uh, so, yeah, so we've been comparing with color, and sometimes it's better, sometimes it's worse. And we're trying to come up with you know the best of both kind of thing. Yeah, um, I mean it looks like the the motion is less sensitive to noise because as long as you have strong edges that move, you you really need uh, a lot of noise before you mess up the notion of an edge. Uh, but at at reasonable noise levels, it's less clear which one is better. Yeah. Yes. Um, building up of that question, could you also like if the, if the if if it is the case that it's sometimes one is better, sometimes the other, you could possibly also combine the two? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, if you haven't done that, uh, I have a student who's supposed to be working on it. Uh, okay. <laughs> I haven't seen any results, but uh, yeah. Um, have you tried this on like a uh, big motion? Uh, what are your methods? Uh, yeah, it does crazy stuff. If the, I mean, yeah, only look at the fixed and grid point. I mean, for large motions, you uh, lose track of the motion. Yeah, so uh, the larger the motion, the less you can amplify the high spatial frequencies. So usually, the way we get away with motion that that's too big is we just give up on the high frequencies. Uh, but then at at some point, you get so low frequency that nothing much happens. Yeah. So the phase-based one can go a little further. Yeah. Yes. Um, have you looked into uh, retiming videos as well? Because a lot of retiming now is done with optical flow or pixel tracking. Yes. So I'm interested how the grid-based approach works. Uh, I'm interested in this too. Yeah. Uh, we we want to try absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the uh, the, the phase-based method is very interesting because it's halfway between something like Grangian and something Eulerian. I think there are lots of things that you usually do with advections that might be interesting to do with this technique because uh, it's more direct. And so I think as a result, it, it, it will tend to be more robust. That's the hope. Yeah. Yes. Um, so it sounds like you've done some amount of experimentation with things that can't be seen at all, really, um, in terms of individual uh, output, essentially. Have you looked at all at taking something that, like you know, the, the laser bounced off of the far away window and turn it back into an audio signal? Have you looked at doing that with just the visible light? I put my high-speed camera at your window, and I can peel the audio off. You're peeling the audio off of both sides, but the laser off is the same susceptibility. Um, yes, we're interested in this. We've, we've made some early experiments, especially, I don't know if you saw, there was a bluish membrane that we have that's a, that's a rubber membrane. We started playing with a you know, loudspeaker and trying to record the motion and getting some audio back, but uh, it's very preliminary at this point. Yeah, we're very interested in this. All right. Uh, there is motion in the sun and the stars, which can only be recorded by cameras. Pardon? Uh, so you can detect the motion in sun and stars using cameras, right? Using telescopes. So have you tried uh, magnifying that motion? I guess it's good. Right? No, we we haven't tried that. Because it's really low frequency and it's not. Good. Yeah, no, but yeah, we should try. Yeah. Thank you very much for Oh, thank you.